Welcome to part one of the two-part series on racism, whiteness, and privilege. I want to give everyone a few seconds to log on. And before we begin, I want to introduce Brandy Jones. Brandy Jones has done a phenomenal job helping me to set up the logistics for this program. And Brandy will make sure that everyone's uh, phone and computers are muted and so that there's no background noise or feedback. Uh, Brandy has also set up our group chat, but she essentially wants us to wait until about um, an hour after we've started to open up the chat for questions. So with that, I want to uh, tell you the plan for today, and that's essentially to maximize the 90 minutes by allowing our panelists opportunity to cover some key topics. We will talk about these issues and more importantly, move towards some solutions. We will leave about 10 minutes uh, at the close of the session to have some Q&A, um, time permitting. With that, I want to thank everyone for joining me on this candid conversation on rightness, racism, and privilege. And I said that incorrectly, so I'll repeat that, racism, whiteness, and privilege. I'm your moderator, Tammy Smithers, and I'm a visiting scholar with the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute for Leadership, Equity, and Justice at Rutgers University. The United States of America is currently in the midst of a two pandemics. We have experienced a global health crisis. COVID-19 stopped us in our tracks and forced us to change the way in which we engage and connect. Some might say that this is the first pandemic, when in actuality, it is not. It is the second. COVID-19 unveiled the racial health disparities among black and brown communities. The pandemic of racial injustice and police brutality has been on display more frequently with the deaths of Ahmaud Arbery on February 23rd, Breonna Taylor on March 13th, George Floyd on May 25th, two days later, Tony McDade on May 27th, Rashard Brooks on June 12th. Sadly, none of this is new. Both pandemics are continuing to take the lives of men and women in the Black community at faster rates than in, uh, in other communities. Black women have shouldered the heavy burden of watching their sons, watching their daughters being victimized, terrorized, and murdered by rogue police officers. These are people who have taken an oath to protect and serve and uphold the law. Black men in this country are target practice for white supremacy ideologies. The penalty for being Black in America is the source of frustrations for generations past and present who have been marginalized, criminalized, demonized, and made to endure far more pain. Implicit bias coupled with white fragility have systematically upheld policies that disproportionately impact Black Americans. Today, let us take this opportunity to discuss, share, and listen. Doing so is vital to how we can move the needle to better understand and have the help of white allies begin the process of dismantling systemic racism. This means some of you must get comfortable with being uncomfortable. The request of you today is to prepare your heart and open your mind to what is going to be a much needed conversation and discussion about three critical terms that many of you have no doubt been hearing and reading about. These terms include racism, whiteness, and privilege. There are three goals for today, and the first is to unpack racism in its actions and move you from a racist mindset to an anti-racist mindset. Second is to deconstruct privilege and what it means and how it is experienced by both white conservatives and quite frankly, white liberals in this country. Third is to introduce allyship as a dismantling tool for racism. Now let me introduce you to the four panelists. First we have with us Michonne Benson. Michonne is an assistant professor of English and African American literature, as well as serves as director of English and majors and minors at Texas Southern University. Dr. Benson has been an educator for over 25 years, beginning her career in K through 12, both as an English teacher and a principal. She actively engages on campus and off campus in a variety of service oriented activities. 
This includes serving as a task force member of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Texas Southern, as well as helps organizations design African-American history curriculum for secondary schools. Our next guest is Michael Elpenes, and Michael is a managing director of a New Jersey-based hedge fund. He has more than 20 years of experience in financial services. His, in his spare time, he has served on a variety of Jewish community-based boards. Additionally, he continues to support causes that include civil rights, women's rights, and LGBTQ plus rights. Our next guest is Melanie Price. Melanie is an author and endowed professor of political science at Prairie View A&M University. Dr. Price's research and teachings interests include black politics, public opinion, political rhetoric, and social movements. Her latest project, Mountaintop Removal, Martin Luther King, Trump and the Racial Mountain, uses Martin Luther King's famous mountaintop speech as a lens for understanding the rise of Trump and the 2016 election. Last but not least is Brandon Mack. Brandon is a community activist, sociologist, and one of the lead organizers of Black Lives Matter Houston. He is dedicated to issues related to the intersections of race, gender, and sexual orientation, and has conducted research on efemiphobia. When he is not organizing and serving in leadership roles on a variety of LGBT causes, he is recruiting international students into Rice University's undergraduate degree programs. Brandon is also working towards a PhD in education leadership and policy studies at University of Houston. So Melanie, I'm going to direct this start to you. Um, what is your take on how we as a nation have arrived at this juncture and in terms of where we are now? And basically just give us a little bit on how we got here. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, I was telling you earlier that Rutgers is my second home um, before it was my home before I came here. And so I'm always excited to do these kinds of projects with them. So thank you. Um, the thing I want to say is people have been trying to understand where we are in this moment. And I think the thing that we should look at is the role that disruption plays in American politics and American life. And one of the things that we know is anytime there's some kind of major so social upheaval, major economic upheaval, whether there's a major health crisis, whether or not there's a war, whether or not there's something that happens that disrupts society, we also use that as a moment to sort of regroup and rethink where we are going in the future. The same can be said of the civil rights movement, which comes on the heels of World War, on the heels of World War II, and is really sort of met in that moment. The same can be said about Reconstruction coming on the heels of the Civil War. But I really think we're in this kind of moment of disruption and chaos right now with the economy as bad as it is, and with COVID-19, and with all of these um, um, law enforcement killings going with impunity. And so we're trying to figure out, and I think that's why this moment seems as energy field as it is, right? Because we are, I think, right now in a moment where American society is asking itself, what are we going to look like for the next little while? The nor normal is gone. And so what will happen? How will we create a new normal? And it's in those moments, I think, that Black people, Black activists, and that other activists of color really can sort of insert their rights into those conversations. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where we are right now. And I'm excited um, to see what comes out of it. I'm ready for us to be on the other side of it. I know all of you have been quarantining like me. And so as soon as we can sort of get out of this, I think we'll be happier. But I am hopeful about sort of what will come out of it. Okay, thank you, thank you. Next, I'm going to um, invite Brandon. Uh, so Brandon, what about you? What is your positionality and particularly given your involvement with Black Lives Matter? Um, and I know that some people are probably wondering, is Black Lives Matter an organization? Uh, is it a movement or is it both? And add to that, what is the central message uh, that you want the audience to know about Black Lives Matter? 
So once again, thank you, uh, Dr. Tammy, for inviting me uh, to be on this panel. Um, first and foremost, what I want everyone to understand is that Black Lives Matter started out as a hashtag. It started out, out as a hashtag that was created by three Black women. Two of those Black women are members of the LGBTQ plus community. So this started out as a rallying cry from the most marginalized by letting them know that fundamentally in the United States of America, Black lives do matter, but they have not always mattered to this country. In terms of what Black Lives Matter is, it is a simple declarative statement, first and foremost, Black Lives Matter, period. There should be no but, there should be no anything else after that. It is purely Black Lives Matter, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Second of all, it is a movement. It is a movement in which we are declaring that we need to move this country to a place where Black Lives Matter and the policies systems, institutions, every single element of this world in the United States, Black lives have to matter and we have to act accordingly. It also functions as an organization. There is a central Black Lives Matter organization, but it also fundamentally operates not in a traditional organizational structure. So every single city, for the most part, can have a Black Lives Matter chapter. And we definitely encourage people to look and see who is operating as the Black Lives Matter chapter for that particular city, because they're the ones who are doing the work on the ground to address the issues that are central to the city. So oftentimes I will hear people say, well, I, don't, I go to the website and I don't see it listed there. And I'm like, there's a reason for that. It's because we don't wanna operate in the traditional organizational structure that is riddled with white supremacy, is based off of structures that are not indicative of the black community that is in that local community. So to basically address your question, it is a movement, mm -hmm. it is a organization, but fundamentally it is a declarative statement that we are making right here and right now that black lives matter, period. Okay, thank you so much. Next, I have Michael. So Michael, uh, what about you um, in terms of the pressing issue, one pressing issue that resonates with you? So, so I think there's a, a couple things that are, that are truly resonating. First and foremost, there's a, a, a fallacy out there that privilege does not exist. And I think we need to establish right off, the right off the bat that privilege does exist in a major, major way. Um, if I am speeding on the highway and I get pulled over, um, I know that my chance of leaving that scene is indisputable that I will be leaving that scene okay. Um, if I am walking in a mall, I know I'm not going to get followed. I also know that if I walk into a job interview, that I will not be looked at in any sort of way that would stop me from getting that job. So once you, once you establish that privilege is not only financial, you have an opportunity to open up the dialogue. Um, when I speak to friends of mine, and you know, I'm very fortunate, I have, I have people who I am close to across the rainbow of colors, shapes, sizes, religions, and everything else. And that's been a very conscious effort on my part, just due to the fact that I think education gets us somewhere. Um, breaking bread gets us somewhere. Having discussions that are completely uncomfortable gets us to a place of better understanding and a very necessary place. So once, once you establish that white privilege or privilege in general is a reality, then you can take that and say, okay, as a white Jewish liberal man who has been very aware of the issues in society, you know, truly my, my entire life, you look and say, I have a responsibility to act up and have a voice. So while over the last several years, I have most certainly um, lost friends, um, argued with people, um, and raised awareness, and, and maybe even perhaps made a name for myself, um, as somebody who's willing to make his voice too loud. But again, that's part of my responsibility. And also, if, if I look at the, the teachings as somebody who is Jewish, we have a responsibility as Jews to help 
um, help repair the world. Takun olam is the phrase. So from my vantage point, having discussions like this, having discussions with family members and friends who are, um, are police officers. My brother's a cop. My best friend is a cop. They're good guys. They would, they would love to break bread and enjoy and have friends and have a, have a dialogue with, with peoples of all, of all kinds in order to make society a better place. And in order to avoid the us versus them, I think people like myself need to show up and have a voice because otherwise it's blacks against whites, it's Jews against other, it, whatever the this verse that is, and that gets us nowhere. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to work together and, you know, and, and really acknowledge the reality of privilege. Okay, okay, thank you so much. Last but not least, Mashan. So, what is your take on everything that is happening uh, right now? Thank you. I'm so honored to be a part of this panel. Um, I do agree with what Melanie said regarding the the way that American politics has disrupted. American life and just after we are healing from either a natural catastrophe or uh, some political or international catastrophe, we're galvanizing as Americans, but we then deflect from conversations that need to be addressed, right, Contin consistently and continually. Um, from uh, the vantage point of someone who is teaching African American literature and who works on an HBCU campus who lives in a historically black neighborhood. I can tell you that there has been a, an historical disallowance of the narrative of African-American history, right? History and the literature. And the same texts, which would provide some real moments of clarity and would give us some, um, some wonderful moments of departure from which to continue discussions that our forebearers had already, they've already discussed these things. Not only have we been disallowed, but we've been convinced that those stories are no longer necessary. So even in popular cultural forms, for example, when we do have a movie uh, come to the big screen like Harriet, the black executive director and the black uh, executive producer and the black director will publicly pronounce that the reason that there is no slavery in the movie Harriet is in large part attributable to the fact that Americans are tired of talking about slavery, right? Well, the, the 50 year olds like myself, 60, 70 year olds may be tired, but we don't have the luxury of being tired because the luxury that America has to forget its past, right? And move forward, we're aspirational, we're dreamers, that luxury is for Black Americans a cultural imperative. Mm -hmm. Slavery restores what history, I mean, well, sorry, history restores what slavery took away, says Schomburg. So we need to be able to partner our collective understanding as a nation about African American literature and partner that with the real on the ground visuals we have mm -hmm. that are now stirring groups of people who have been uh, benignly, benignly neglectful of that history, stirring them into a consciousness that is unmistakable and that requires them to now address a very real issue since it, that it's been since America's inception. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you, everybody. So I want to now um, just talk about the panel a little bit, uh, this session rather, and I want to provide some context for the audience as to why we thought this discussion was necessary. Um, I recently wrote an article, I co-wrote an article three weeks ago, and that article was entitled, The Weaponry of Whiteness, Entitlement, and Privilege. And I received some feedback. Uh, I received positive feedback. I received responses from individuals uh, seeking to understand how they could help, but were also conflicted about how to reconcile or reconcile the way that whiteness and privilege were used in the same context as racism. So one of the messages that I did receive was from a woman um, who happens to be on the panel for next, uh, next time. So tomorrow we'll meet her. Uh, but this woman wrote, um, 
something that it really crystallized her positionality. Um, and so she spoke about, in these exact words, she stated to me, I am white female, I drive a pickup truck, I own a ranch, I'm a Republican, I'm a mom, I am an educator, and my husband, husband is a law enforcement officer. She then went on to write that people like me feel a bit out of place in this. They see the injustice, but don't know what to say or how to understand it. They can't comprehend privilege because no one who looks like them has tried to explain very well. Perhaps they don't even know that many black people. I think racism sounds like the KKK to a lot of white people, and that just isn't it. It is a continuum. The best thing white people can do right now is to try to understand where they fall on that continuum and work to improve and to listen. Shut up, sit down and listen. So this was a message that I thought was very poignant. Um, we ended up communicating and decided that this was a, a, a good forum to have this type of discussion with both blacks and whites. And so here we are. So I want to thank that individual for nudging me to really move to the next step. And that's to kind of find solutions um, once we talk about this. So with that, I want to start with Melanie. Um, I want to direct the first question to you. So with that statement, and using a socio-political framework, how would you describe this phenomenon of white privilege? You know, white privilege is uh, something that's easier to see if you're not white, right? Because that's the design of it, right? That is, whiteness is the default for everything. And the example that I always like to use that I find people, that resonates with everyday people the most is, when you go into Target and you look for skin colored band, nude band-aids, or you look for nude pantyhose if you still wear them, or you look for anything that is called or nude lipstick, does it look like your race? It turns out that it doesn't for me and for most people I know, but there's a way in which the world is set up to 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 have whiteness, have white people's lives be the default for everybody else. And you might say, well, it's just a Band-Aid. But that Band-Aid is just one kind of example I could give you over the course of my life where I have to adjust to the fact that I am not white. And the, the privilege of not having to adjust is the thing that makes it white privilege, right? You, I, the, the ability to walk through the world and to have certain kinds of institutions set up to meet your needs, to have institutions set up, to have organizations built around what your choices might be, to have builders build houses in your neighborhood that have more windows than ones they build in neighborhoods for people of color, right? That seems small, but it's actually huge, right? And it's the idea that you can walk through life without having to constantly, you don't have to think about your race because everything has sort of been built for you. And there's a way in which other people don't have that luxury. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Michael, I'm putting you on the spot here. Go to it. <laughs> what does white privilege look like for you? Um, white privilege is, is a lot of um, what Melanie just said and what I stated in the open, which is I never have to stop and wonder whether I'll be accepted because of the color of my skin. And I'm saying that as somebody who on my mother's side, I am first generation American. On my father's side, I think I'm fourth or fifth. So, you know, when you think about immigrants who came here by the second generation, the, the accent is gone. So then they're just white. Okay, the, the, the folks on this, this panel are more educated than I am, yet you're still black. So the reality is if somebody wants to judge you for that, then that's the, the elephant in the room without being hidden. It doesn't have to be discussed. So to me, that's what white privilege is, is the fact that I could walk in and the reality is the worst thing somebody can say is, well, maybe he's a little short, or maybe he doesn't, they don't like my tie if I walk in. 
but they're never going to say, well, he's discounted from, his, from this position because of the color of his skin. Okay, I'm not going to get followed because of the color of my skin. Okay, I, to me, that's the privilege of it all. And I think where we, we really do a disservice in discussing privilege is I think most, most whites perceive privilege as a financial gain and nothing else. So in effect, what happens is we, we tell people who are, let's say, working class whites who are working 60 hours a week at a construction site or this place or that place, and we tell them they have privilege. And they come right back and say, well, I don't have any privilege. I work my, my hide off. And the fact of the matter is, it's not about that. Because, you know, I certainly know people within the black community or, or anywhere else who work two or three jobs and may work 80 or 90 hours a week in order to pay the rent. But the fact of the matter is, they're working hard. So it's not financial. It's all the other things. So it's the, the assistant and, and, and I, I'm going to have to call you Dr. Tammy, which is mind blowing because you and I used to break bread with each other all the time. But, you know, Tammy, this is like thinking about the, the assistants that, or the executive assistants that we used to speak with and, and work with who had been in that same chair for 60 years, 40 years at 60 years old, mm -hmm. knowing that they never got the opportunity that I did. Mm -hmm. That's the privilege. Mm -hmm. Okay. Michonne, what is your response to Michael's uh, description of white privilege? I mean, I think he's spot on. And actually, um, you know, I commend Michael and, and others, other allies who are brave enough to begin to examine and reflect on the various ways in which their bodies successfully negotiate the, so the society, right? Um, of course, there are some people who are watching this um, and certainly on the Twitter sphere and on face, gram, Insta chat that talk about, um, you know, how, well, we, we just had a black president, right? And a lot of my students even um, have never known really any other president than Obama. So they look to the Obamas and the LeBronzes and the, and the Oprahs as an indication that proof positive of the fact that America is a meritocracy and they have bought into the American dream they've been sold on, on cable and in uh, other networks that suggests that if they just pull themselves up, right? If they just act right, pull their pants up, if they just straighten their hair and go to the right schools, then they too can share in the privilege afforded to Americans. And to a certain extent, they're right. But by and large, we all know as adults who have gone through this, racism is not the 911 call. Mm -hmm. That's the cough hmm. right, of the disease. That is the, that is the symptom. So if we, they've been taught, which is part of that disallowance of narratives and what systemic racism looks like, if they've been taught that the 911 call and the uh, you know, president stumping, saying really interesting things about other races, if that is what racism looks like, then America you know, is pretty good because there aren't that many people that, that do that kind of thing. Um, but it's going to take some critical thinking from which students have been disallowed from doing in middle and high school. It takes some critical thinking skills to see into the deep structure and a willingness not to buy into conspiracies, but just to suspend disbelief so that their feeling, their intuition about certain things can be translated into clear, uh, tangible articulation of okay. what it is that they're experiencing. Okay. Okay, thank you. Brandon, so in your work as an organizer and activist, in your opinion, what role does white privilege uh, play in keeping certain groups of people oppressed? White privilege plays a huge part of this. And I wanna go back to first kind of the definition that we kind of brought up. You have to remember that for us as black people in the United States, we are expected to understand white culture. We are expected to understand white history. 
there is not that same expectation when it comes to understanding our culture and understanding our history. And that starts at the very beginning. If every one of us thinks back to even elementary school, when did we get to learn about black history? Maybe February, and it wouldn't even be even within February and we didn't get much. But every other month, every other week, we were expected to learn about a history that did not take us into account. So hence, that's why history is so critically important because as the old adage goes, it's destined to repeat itself and we continue to see it repeating itself over and over again with black people being devalued. And it starts with the fact that we're not equally valued even in the education, first and foremost, and in other ways. So I wanna bring that up. In terms of other ways that I see white privilege manifesting itself, especially in the activist level, we all know that we have a First Amendment right to protest. But in yet, I see the way that protests, when done by Black Lives Matter and other uh, movements where it's centering Black people, the response is not the same. So let's take it back to when COVID-19 was first happening and we were seeing these protests primarily by white individuals who would go to the state houses and talk about how they wanted their haircuts. They wanted to go to the beauty salons. They would get up in police faces, yelling, cursing, doing all sorts of things. Not a gun was pulled, not a riot gear was worn. They were allowed to do that. I have seen it directly in every single action that I have done as an organizer and activist of Black Lives Matter Houston, where we go and we just organize centering black lives, centering what has been going on with us, and immediately we are met with riot gear, immediately talked negatively at, and immediately perceived as being dangerous. Mm -hmm. That is white privilege. Mm. You automatically get perceived as being positive, good, boys will be boys, all those old adages to give grace and space to you for doing bad behavior. Mm -hmm. I just exist and immediately, I am met with a gun, I am met with a nightstick, I am met with riot gear, all for doing the exact same thing that we are all doing in terms of asserting our rights. So that is what white privilege is doing, is in the fact that we automatically get criminalized, we automatically get dehumanized, but in yet, white individuals don't have to even deal or think about that. Okay, thank you. So along those same lines, whiteness has been defined by scholars as a translucent cloak attempting to mask racism and white supremacy in society within organizations and among higher education institutions. Within this construct of whiteness is white privilege. The intersection of white privilege antagonizes and oppresses blacks, other people of color, and immigrants. The notion of others or them versus us or othering creates division and separation of the haves and have nots. We hear some individuals who are unable or who are unwilling to acknowledge that racism even exists. So my question is for you, Michonne. What would you say to those individuals who use whiteness as a weapon, a la Amy Cooper? I, I, this is a, a really, Tammy, why would you do this to me? Okay, so so looking at, again, going back to the 911 calls, okay. In order for us to really understand how Amy Cooper came to understand that she did have the privilege of calling 911, right, to get rescued in that moment where she felt attacked allegedly. Um, we really have to interrogate what police are designed to do, right? Um, not just restore order, you know, and, and this is no disparagement of Michael's family members and friends, you know, who, who are police officers, but the idea that policing happens because that's what police were designed to do right? Police, the practice of policing started in the Reconstruction era to ensure that 
newly freed black bodies were where they were supposed to be when they were supposed to be. Okay, there weren't police necessarily before emancipation. There were overseers who tended to, okay, or slave catchers who would steal and, and trade slaves and so forth. By the way, there were no black slave catchers, but we'll talk about that maybe at a later time. Um, so the idea that, that uh, for example, the governor of California hired Klansmen from the South, the Deep South, and brought them to California to police neighborhoods in the 1960s should then be not, we should not be alarmed when we see 30, 40, 50 years later that those communities are being uh, policed so harshly by the same people that, you know, they were supposed to be policed by. So with respect to the, the Amy Cooper call, as a symptom of this larger system of privilege and entitlement, um, in many ways, she sees herself as an extension of the very people who come to see her. Even if she won't acknowledge that the people who are protecting and serving her neighborhood are extensions of her, she feels that, she intuits that they are responsible for protecting her white female body. Because as the most, as the most, um, I won't say prized possession, but we do live in a patriarchal construct, right? So as the, as the prized possession of a patriarchal hegemony, she is that body which is valued the most. And although she may not articulate that value that she has, she understands that her body is supposed to be protected at all costs. So again, that goes back to what Michael was saying about privilege. She doesn't have that really that capacity or she hasn't taken the time to reflect um, and see herself in that way. Okay, good. Michael, you and I, friend, have had some extensive conversations about certain events of the past several weeks. Um, I alluded to this earlier, but can you share with the panel and audience um, some of the conversations that you had in speaking with the white friends about the disparity you have come to recognize, in particular, the healthcare crisis with COVID-19, um, which is, by the way, a racial injustice. Um, so can you just give us a little bit uh, of some of the conversation and the, aware and the awakening or awareness? Absolutely. So um, I want to I wanna preface uh, very quickly with the fact that um, on Facebook or Twitter, I'm incredibly active with my political views. So I'm the annoying guy who you don't necessarily want to follow if you just want to see pictures of food. So that being said, uh, with that backdrop, um, in preparation for this, it's easy for me to speak to uh, Tammy or other friends who are like-minded, for the most part, with some of the things that I feel. And I can't necessarily say experience, but I could say feel. And things that I've witnessed, friends of mine um, what they've gone through, and also to a much, much, much smaller extent, um, what Jews in America go through as well. So I'm wearing many hats when I start saying this. So in preparation, I also spoke to probably a dozen lean, right, white friends who I have debated over the years, whether it was about white privilege, whether it was about uh, Colin Kaepernick taking a knee, whether, you know, a multitude of other issues. And I think what COVID did, and um, by no means is 120,000 plus deaths a, a good thing in any way, and, and obviously, no, hopefully nobody takes it that way. But what it did is it allowed people to stop and concentrate on the, on the, the killings and the issues of the last few months, and also say, well, why is the fatality rate within the black community three times what it is in the white community? And talking about whether it's um, different healthcare systems, different housing situations, um, you know, but most of it is based on healthcare, right? So um, I have seen personally um, one friend in particular who literally called me last Thursday, right leaning guy who he and I have battled for years, three, four, five years of battling, literally called me in tears and basically said, okay, I finally get it. So not only did he understand it from a healthcare perspective, but his wife is a teacher. And she said, you know what? Some of the black students have it much different than the white students. 
and they don't have four devices at home to log in for online schooling. You know, they're not able to do um, teleconferencing with a doctor if they're sick. And this all becomes a thing where this simple idea that you're able to log in and talk to your doctor or go to a hospital that's well equipped to take care of somebody and know that the walls in your apartment dwelling isn't ridden with asbestos. These are all things that matter. And it's healthcare, but it's also, um, you know, the real estate in which people live in, et cetera. So when I talk to the white people that I know, there are some who categorically dismiss all of this. And I think those are the people that are gonna be the harder nut to crack. But, you know, hopefully this, this gives a little bit of hope. Out of the 12 people I spoke to or so, I would say about 10 of them at least came closer to the middle of understanding. And if, if a panel like this or um, somebody like myself can be loud and wake people up to the little things, it'll grow into the bigger things over time. And COVID was in some ways the great equalizer because this sucks for everybody. Full lockdown, especially here in New Jersey. So if you're locked down anyway, you start waking up and you're saying, well, okay, life isn't all that good, but wait a minute, it's even worse for those people, those people. Right. Then you start understanding it all. Mm -hmm. so, so I know a lot of people who are not liberals like me who are reading everything about Mr. Floyd's murder and they're understanding and saying, wait a minute, there's no disputing this case. So here we are. So... Um, it is about healthcare. It is about policing. It's about understanding and communicating. We got to do that. We're not doing it enough. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to move into another section, and it, I want to basically talk about the systemic racism that term. Um, so to understand what systemic racism is and how it is viewed in this country, I studied the works of many race scholars from the 1990s and present-day race scholars, such as Ibram. Ex Kendi. As such, I will use Professor Kendi's definition of racism as this, and he states that it's the marriage of beliefs, attitudes, and actions that evolve into racist ideas, which are then merged with racist policies that produce and normalize racial, racial inequalities. So Professor Kendi also writes that denial is the heartbeat of racism, beating across ideologies, races, and nations. He further states that the only way to undo racism is to consistently identify it, describe it, and then dismantle it. He suggests that calling out racial policies go beyond what we define them as and using terms such as institutional racism and structural racism and systemic racism. So these terms he states are typically redundant because racism in itself are, is all those three things. Basically it's institutional, it's structural and systemic. So Kendi then goes on to define racist policy as more tangible by stating what exactly the problem is and exactly where the problem is. And another common phrase um, that we speak about is racial discrimination, and that it's an immediate and visible manifestation of an underlying racial policy. So therefore, to focus on racial discrimination takes our eyes off the central agents of racism. And these central agents of racism is racist policy and racist policymakers, or what Kendi calls racist power. So I'm going to repeat the definition of racism that we're going to use for this discussion today. And that is this, racism is the marriage of beliefs, attitudes, and actions that evolve into racist ideas, which are merged with racist policies that produce and normalize racial inequalities. So I wanna pose this next question to Melanie. Using the definition of racism that I just st stated, what can white allies do to begin the process to expunge or eradicate systemic racism? I think the thing that probably is most important in that, in that is the action, right? I think we have lots of moments in American life 
where uh, whites have these sort of um, uh, epiphanies, right, about inequality and about the ways in which they might be privileged over other groups. I'm thinking about Hurricane Katrina. I'm thinking about, uh, and every time they say, well, the veil has been lifted. Now we see that things are different. But that veil then shortly goes back on and then we have to lift the veil again and again. And COVID-19 is one of those moments, right? Where they have been talking about lifting this veil. But I think the thing that now comes is action. And I think the thing that is difficult about action is because it requires you to give up things, mm -hmm. right? And if you are going to be non-racist, it requires you to give up the religion of American exceptionalism. It requires you to give up um, the belief that everything you have is because you worked hard to get it, right? It requires you to give up the notion that you can actually have a schools that are 14 times the funding of schools down the road from you, right? It requires you to give up things. And so now the question is what kinds of sacrifices what kinds of things have you gotten that were undeserved that you now have to sort of give back? Because I think there is this belief that we can fix racism by just raising everybody up to white standards. I think there's this belief that there is this never ending pie that we can all live off of. But there are only so many seats in a college admissions every year. And if you are saying that somehow there should never be a school where 89, 90% of the kids who are going there are white and it's funded by taxpayers, that means some fewer white kids are gonna have to go there, right? And so we have to talk about the ways in which you have to be willing to accept the remedies. You have to be willing to say that I'm going to remedy this. You have to be willing to say that my child is no more special than other children, right? My life is no more special than other people's lives in that there are some basic things that we all should be able to get. And see, that's the hard part. It's easy to read the books. We've seen the New York Times bestseller list and how great it is and everything on there is about being anti-racist. But the question really is about actions. And one of the things that we know, I'll say this and finish, one of the things that we know about American history is that white Americans have a limited palette for remedy, racial remedies. And so they fix a problem and then they're like, good, that's done, let's move on. But moving on always means going back to your white privilege, going back to the things that you had before. And so the question is, when you try to move on this time, Will you forget all these things that you're super interested in right now? I mean, I guess that's really the question right, for me. Good, good. Brandon, um, I'm going to ask you to expound by giving your thoughts on how the infestation of systemic racism has created a blind spot by the dominant culture for marginalized groups. Oh, there is so much I want to say. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and start off with this. First and foremost, I think allyship is part of the problem. Mm. I think that allyship is a very weak paradigm and it is one of the paradigms that is allowing what we're seeing to perpetuate itself. And here's the reason why I say that. An ally is someone who can step in and out of the fight. Mm -hmm. When the fight happens, they're there, but at the end, when you're having to deal with the remnants of that battle, whatever happened, allies can step away and just say, I was there for you in this fight. Now that this impact didn't necessarily go the way that we wanted to, I'm going to go over here and I'm stepping out. And then you're left with the cleanup. Mm. For me, I believe in accompliceship and comradeship. Here's the big difference. An accomplice if we go into jail, we both go into jail. We both feel the same sense of loss. We both feel the same sense of win. We're both in it because we're accomplices. Mm -hmm. A comrade, same situation. 
we're both in it. So to me, that is what is needed now in this particular moment. I don't need allies because once again, allies for a moment are going to try to get what is best for them, mm. right? They're going to get what's best for them out of the deal. And, oh, you're just there to help me get what is best for me. So that's where a lot of marginalized people, we get hurt in the situation is because we are thinking, oh, we're both in it to achieve gains, but, oh, you got your gain. Now you're gone. And I'm still here left to fend for myself. One of the movements in which I have definitely seen that happen has been in the LGBTQ plus movement. So for example, marriage, marriage, marriage. That was the big seeming to be overall LGBTQ issue. Primarily, that was a white LGBTQ plus main issue. They got marriage equality. And now where are they when it comes to the disproportionate amount of black trans individuals who do not have the same employment opportunities, who do not have the same housing opportunities, who have all these other isms, where are they? It's easy for you to say, oh, we're an ally because you got what you wanted out the deal. But now that you got what you wanted out the deal and we still have these other isms that I as a black individual am dealing with, where are you? oh, I'm here as your ally, but I got what I want, so now I'm going to go over here. Good luck with you dealing that. Call me when I need it. Oh, no, no, no. I don't need to call you. If you are an accomplice, you're still in this with me. You're going to make sure that I am okay as well. And then we also got to think about, going back to Melanie's example, about that pie. Let's talk about what the ingredients are made of. Okay, let's talk about that. Let's change those ingredients so that it becomes something better that everyone else has an access to instead of it always being by the same standards because we got to think about what are those quote unquote standards and what are they based off of. If you go back to those standards and look that, oh, this isn't taking into consideration the uniqueness that comes with blackness or the uniqueness that comes with being indigenous or the uniqueness that comes with being in any others, then you got to change those standards. Because diversity, equity, and inclusion are intentional choices, mm -hmm. okay? I'm getting so sick of everyone saying, oh, I need to steady the issue. It's been steadied, okay? Mm -hmm. Trust me, we got plenty of studies and plenty of academics. <laughs> oh, we need to, I'm like, you need to make the intentional decision that you're going to institute making this a more diverse institution. You need to make sure that you're putting in the policies that are going to make sure that this is equitable. You're going to pull up that chair to make sure that this is inclusive. Or if not, burn the table down, rebuild another one that is emblematic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So once again, it's the whole allyship notion for me that is what's causing a lot of these problems is because you can step away, but I'm still in this fight. Oh, no, 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 no. If we are in this, we are all in this, and we're going to get it to where everybody gets what they should need from this situation and from what's going on. I felt that. <laughs> I felt that. That was good. That was good. So I took some notes. So basically, we need to change the language, right? We need to change the language from being an ally to being an accomplice or a comrade. So it's 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 allies or it's accompliceship <laughs> or comradeship. So that's a new term. We gotta we gotta put that out there. And then the other piece of this that you mentioned was the intentionality of those three things, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and to kind of dovetail off of uh, Melanie's point about the action, that's sort of the action piece too, right? Um, and I think those are some key concepts that we need to kind of keep in mind as we talk about this. So Michael, I know that you pride yourself on being an ally, um, and I think that- Not anymore. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think <laughs> maybe in a different place. I think you may be one of the others that he calls. So, you know, you know, we we always talk about uh, ally, being white allies having to eradicate the systemic racism. Like we, it takes that group, right? So, you know, kind of speak to you can talk, you can disagree or agree to what he stated, but how would you suggest um, allyship, or if we change the term, uh, accompliceship or comradeship, be leveraged in the eradication of systemic racism? So, so by the way, first and foremost, following Brandon and Melanie in this is um, is very difficult, and, I, and I'm going to say that because, um, as as wide open as I've always felt my eyes um, are, um, there's more to it, and there's always going to be more to it because we don't walk in the same shoes. Um, I can be very cognizant of the fact that we're in different shoes, but I'm still not in your shoes. So, 
you know, as as you were talking, Brandon, um, you know, the one thing I, I would say, and, and, and this is not a disagreement, but maybe a point on top of it even, is the fact that you're exactly right, but I think we also have to move the needle from the disbelievers to maybe get to allies to get to the next level. Because the fact of the matter is, if you, t if you spoke to the folks that I talk to, who I've worked with over the years, who I go to Rutgers football games with and everything else, the, the, the opinions are diverse. And the gentleman I spoke about earlier, you know, who's a pretty conservative guy, whose wife is a teacher, that guy is now to the point of almost being an ally. And then you got to move that needle even more. And I think as, as, as whites, we have to realize, other than the, the example given, which was, was smart, and I never really thought of it this way, about a university opening up more seats to you know, the other, other than whites, um, I think as a, as a people, we need to realize that if I give up some rights to you, I'm not losing any pie. Okay, and the fact of the matter is, you know, I, I always give the example of a bar pie. If you go into a bar and order a bar pie, you don't really want to share it because it's about the size of one person. But the reality is, this isn't the case. I don't lose rights by you having more rights. And I think that, that mindset takes time to develop. And I think if we're willing to put in that time and take advantage and almost exploit the fact that we have far more people listening than we did before, it'll help us moving, move the needle to a situation where we're, we're all ride or die. We're not allies, we're ride or die. That's it, we're humanity. And that's quite honestly what I've always been taught and that's kind of where I am at. Okay, good, good, thank you. So I'm gonna move us along a little bit here. So we talked about uh, the, uh, the concept of, of racism. But racism is a powerful collection of racist policies that lead to racial inequality and are substantiated by racist ideas. Anti-racism is a powerful collection of anti-racist policies that lead to racial equity and are substantiated by uh, anti-racist ideas. So I'm going to talk to Michonne here for a second about uh, what is your view on what it means to be a non-racist versus anti-racist. And I do know the, de 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 the definition that, that non-racist is not really a, a thing, but that's what everybody seems to be kind of defaulting to. So can you just talk to us about uh, what the difference or explain what a non-racist versus anti-racist means to you? I may have a different purview than some of the other panelists. And so, you know, this, I think this is a good point of departure for further conversation. Um, we live in a society, particularly since Obama's election, right? We live in a society that considers itself to be post-racial. So if Obama has been the president and has sat in the highest seat in the land, then that should be evidence enough that America is becoming non-racist right we are in, in non-racism non-racism the way that i have think i understand it is this color blindness right where racism just does not exist and so if we are all kumbaya and if we are all shaking hands and being very nice to each other then we can act you know we can say that there is no racism when nothing could be further from the truth okay um, we know this. Anti-racism, on the other hand, is this active, uh, it, it's, a more, it's a more aggressive, rather than passive aggressive non-racism, <laughs> it's more active in, um, in demonstrating that we can create policies that actually legislate people's hearts. Not even activity, but we can create laws that will make sure that people hold themselves to the letter of being not being anti-racist, right? And ironically, even some of the most well-intentioned black legislators, God bless them, 
are leading the charge to implement uh, policies that on the surface seem very anti-racist. They seem to confront and combat the real issues, the gut level feelings and sensibilities of Americans who may otherwise be overtly racist. I'll give you a point of fact and then I'll be done. Sheila Jackson Lee, uh, you know, this federal, this federal holiday, right? This um, uh, making Juneteenth a federal holiday is one instance we don't have time to go into very much, but also the idea that maybe some people who make the 911 calls should have to pay some kind of penalty or face punishment for demonstrating an overtly anti-black uh, performance, right? So laws are going to be anti-racist to combat that. Well, first of all, there are already fraudulent 911 call laws on the books in every state, in every municipality. There, nobody can call 911 erroneously, fraudulently. You just can't do that, okay? But because everyone is either willfully blind to the fact that when a Black person calls 911, who's in help? And the very same officers who are not anti-racist necessarily, or who have not been, come to uh, listen to the black 911 caller's complaints, the police officers can take the black caller into custody legally and say, well, there was nothing going on. That, that was a, a fraudulent call. You know, and you're calling, one, you're calling 911 against a white person. And that, you know, we don't, we can't get into the minds and the hearts of people who are actively pra pra practicing racism or who really don't understand that that's what they're doing. So uh, I think Michael said something to this effect. You know, he was saying that the needle has to be moved, right? That, but I'm tired of waiting. Mm -hmm. Justice denied <laughs> is a product of justice too long deferred. So how do we, how do we give people time? Because people do have a growing curve. Uh, you know, younger people are coming along and they haven't had the time to have these conversations. How do we as older American citizens take accountability, you know, mm -hmm. and stop practicing racism in ways that seem on the surface anti-racist, but actually uh, advance the very same system that we rail against. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, Michael, Professor Kendi espouses that the terms racist and anti-racist are not fixed identities. And this sort of adds to what Michon was saying, but he further states that the heartbeat of racism is denial and that the heartbeat of anti-racism is confession and admission. So based on your value uh, system, what are your thoughts for someone who has to come to terms with whether or not their actions or their thoughts reinforce racist ideology? So, so I think first and foremost, you need to, um, you need to really look outside yourself to see where they have benefited in some way and not even realized it. Because I think that's, that's the first step. And, you know, um, Michonne, I, I, I agree with you. You know, it, it's taking too long, 100%. Uh, but I think, I think people are stubborn when things are okay for them. And if you don't see any of these things, you, you're not gonna get off the chair and start working, unfortunately. So, you know, you never want the situations that we've seen in the last few months, but if nothing else, nothing else, people who I never expected to agree with me and voice with me are now all of a sudden going to rallies. You know, and that's, that to me is, is maybe the needle is moving faster than, than we thought, at least in this moment in time. And hopefully it stays, right? So, so hopefully that continues and people, people continue this finding themselves in this whole thing. And once they see this, then the idea of being non-racist or anti-racist really starts defining themselves. To me, non-racist is a neutral term. Mm -hmm. Neutral doesn't get us anywhere. Yep. You know, um, if, if I was sitting here with, with a bunch of fellow Jews, we would say people who are non, you know, non-anti-Semitic, not grammatically correct, but non-anti-Semitic are neutral. 
So that means you're kind of sort of okay about things that go on in, you know, Jewish um, um, synagogues or Jewish community centers or rallies in Charlottesville. My, my point is you can't be neutral. So we need to get more people who are willing to open their, their mouths and maybe not be as, as loud and, and, and obnoxious as I am. But you know what? Yeah, you do. <laughs> because otherwise it's us first them. Mm -hmm. And the idea that I can sit here with, you know, three or four people who are significantly more educated than I am, significantly more aware than I am, and help define and, and, and mold the conversation and the next steps, mm -hmm. I think how we start doing that, and we get to be against racism, not just neutral. Neutral doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to move us quickly. So uh, two things. So we, you know, I've been seeing social media, right? There's this Black America versus White America. Um, we saw the George Floyd, um, the tape. Uh, there was 121 words that he spoke. Basically, he narrated his entire, his, his murder, right? He, he narrated everything uh, in terms of uh, up until his last breath, literally. Um, so Melanie, can we talk about um, police brutality? And when we talk about police brutality and the treatment of black and brown folk in this country, what characterization of systemic racism do you visualize in this context? And just give us maybe a few, few couple of sentences to help give us some clarity here. Um, I think the thing that I have been trying to say to people in this moment is we need to stop talking about police police relationships in African-American communities as if there was ever a good time, right? Mm -hmm. As if there's ever a moment we can go back to where there were excellent relationships between police and the people in their community, because that has never existed. And so the first thing we need to do is throw out that narrative and talk about what goes forward. And I think it's not just about, when I think of systemic relationship, it's not, police brutality is a, a dramatic moment in the kinds of daily harassment and um, uh, routine humiliations that Black people exist, that Black people experience at the hands of police, right? Whether or not that's being stopped for driving while Black whether or not that's being uh, having the police called on you for having a picnic in the park, whether or not that's um, um, the police officer showing up at your house and treating you in, like a thief in your own house, right? And so there are all these ways that, that the police departments, with their own statistics, demonstrate how Black people are routinely harassed Latinx brown people are routinely harassed by the police. And, and this is true if you look at the statistics, by the way, if you look in white neighborhoods, mm -hmm. then black people in those, it's still black people in those neighborhoods who are being stopped. It's not like if you go to a white neighborhood, all the crime automatically becomes white. It's whatever space a black body finds itself, itself the police statistics themselves will tell you that they are overwhelmingly in contact with, with black and brown bodies. And that's true, even though they don't overwhelmingly end up in arrests. And so if you're stopping people and not arresting them, you're just harassing them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and, and so uh, Brandon, uh, we've heard a lot about, and I'm all into social media here, right, about defunding the police, particularly as it relates to becoming retrained or them de-escalating. Um, the terminology defund, I think, has confused some people, um, and maybe there's this left-right conversation. Um, can you provide the context around what the defund campaign means, if it is a campaign, and does it mean getting rid of the police? department altogether or what can you just expound on that a little bit for our audience sure so first off i want to go back to just the history and one of the central problems that i think people are not looking at when it comes to the police department mm -hmm. as has been mentioned by some of the other pan panelists there is a history of racism as it comes to the whole notion of policing mm -hmm. the fact that the modern day police department is directly related to slave catchers, 
directly related to perceiving black people as not being human and being perceived as property. All those things have developed into the police culture that we currently see that manifests itself in the ways that uh, police interact with black people. And what hasn't happened hasn't been a dismantling of that police culture. It keeps getting transmitted. And a lot of what I've seen has been responses to that is, oh, we've hired a more diverse police force, which means that they've hired black and brown officers. Well, you also have to remember, back during slavery, we had black and brown people who were slave catchers, who so therefore immediately hiring black people or hiring brown people doesn't change that because police culture also gets transmitted and also gets learned and picked up because we often hear they're gonna pick the blue before they pick the black or any or, or any type of situation like that. So one that's one of the reasons for why there has to be a dismantling of what's going on because we have to dismantle police culture. And the only way that that's gonna happen is it has to be once again intentional and a breakdown. So getting to defund versus abolish police. Mm -hmm. What defund police, the movement related to that is, is that a lot of money, if you look at city budgets, if you look at our overall budget as a country, a lot of our money is towards police, military, all those different types of uh, agencies. And when those agencies receive all that funding, they're using it to put more cops on the street, they're using more towards weapons, tactics, and things of that nature. When we call for defunding the police, we're saying we need to allocate those funds that are going towards police to other areas that could really solve the problems that you're expecting police to deal with. So for example, many times police get calls for dealing with individuals who are going through a mental health episode. They're not trained to deal with mental health issues. So instead, what do they do? They use their militarized methods of trying to get someone to comply instead of trying to understand this person's going through a mental uh, health ep episode, so therefore they can't comply with what you're asking them to do. Instead, you're pulling a gun asking them to comply, but they're not hearing you. They're not even seeing you right now because of what they're going through. When you defund the police, that money can go towards having more social workers, having more psychiatrists, who could then be called out to deal directly with what that person is dealing with in that situation, rather than having a police officer to go there. So that's one method by which we're talking about defunding, is that why are we using all this money that is not going towards protecting us, because it definitely has been proven that police really don't protect us. They also don't necessarily have a very successful solving crime rate, when we could be using those funds towards community projects, towards more social workers, towards addressing homelessness, towards addressing police, I mean, uh, food insecurity, all those isms that we've been talking about, they're all a part of the same systemic problems that we could be using resources towards in order to address those central issues, rather than putting it towards another police department and another officer who is carrying that negative imagery and that negative devaluation of Black people into the street that leads to another George Floyd, that leads to another uh, Ahmaud Aubrey, that leads to another Breonna Taylor, that leads to another Tony McDade. That's what we're talking about. And when we call, talk about abolishing the police, what we're saying is we need to abolish the police department. We need to abolish this police culture. Abolish that situation, but you could still have a system in place in which if you need to be defended, what does that look like? But it's not based off of this historical anti-black system that we are currently operating with. Wow, thank you, thank you. I wanna give uh, the panelists here time to uh, give us some closing thoughts on where do we go from here, uh, just sort of taking everything uh, that into account that we've discussed today. Where, where would you like to um, you know, end um, the conversation or at least create the, the solution or action around uh, a key point? So who wants to start? I will let Melanie start. Would you like to start, Melanie? Sure. Um, I guess I'm trying to think about this on two levels. So when I think about the ideas of whiteness and white privilege, the thing that I have, you know, white people are very interested in talking about this right now. It is a very, uh, it's taken up a good deal of my last few weeks. And so one of the things that I, I always want to say is that one of the ways that you start to think about race more 
is if you're in places where you are not in the majority. And I have found having taught on predominantly white campuses for much of my career, that whites, unlike people of other races, rarely find themselves as the numerical minority in a space. They don't tend to live in communities where they're not in the, in the majority. They don't go to church where they're not in the majority. They don't send their kids to school where their kids are not in the majority. And so spend some time in places that are not geared towards you, right? Go into those spaces and don't come in there expecting people to make space for you, but figure out how to live in places where you're not in the majority. And it turns out it's life-changing. And you might actually have some sense of how, what it feels like for other people. Um, create relationships that are substantial and meaningful. Not your work friend who you think is your friend, but you have never been to their houses. You never eat meals with them outside of the break room. Like that's not friendship for black people. So mm -hmm. black people who invite you to their houses, who let you come in, who want you to meet their families, that's relationships. And when you have those, it changes. The other thing I wanna say is we're in a moment of movement expansion now. This is a moment where we're going to start, it won't just be talk about the police, we'll start to move to larger, move, larger discussions about healthcare, about educational inequities, about environmental racism, about patriarchy, about the way, about lots of other things. And you have to be open to having discussions. It's, and it's true that white people need to be open to having discussions about their own privilege, but people of color have to be open to having discussions about the ways in which we experience racism differently, depending on our own racial position, right? In having grown up in the state of Texas, where there is, it's a very, well, in Houston, which is a very diverse city, you come to know, sure, there are ways in which Black people experience racism, but there are surely ways in which Latinos experience racism that is different from us and that Asian Americans are different from us. And so now is the time, I think, to start expanding your mind, to start thinking about other people, to practice empathy, and empathy and not just, I feel bad for you, but because I feel bad for you, I am going to try to make it so that your that the thing that I feel bad about doesn't impact you in that way anymore, right? Be a pragmatic impact, right? Don't be a person who's like, that's so horrible. Think about how you can individually fix it and then set about fixing it yourself. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, who I will have, um, Michonne, do you wanna go next with your closing thoughts? Oh, uh, I think she needs can't to hear you, Michelle. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, I, Melanie, I'm just singing your praises because I was like, there's not a whole lot to say beyond what Melanie said. I, I just want to add a couple of points, though. Um, we do live in an era of de facto segregation, right? Um, I think that's, that's a, in, by and large, uh, a lot of what Melanie alluded to. And when we don't understand how other people feel, then we tend to look at popular cultural forms to inform us about who other people are in the society that we're supposed to be aware of, but not a part of. Um, and I would just ask, I see that there are a lot of women on the line, and I would just ask maybe uh, women if they think that the images of, if they're, if they're not really, still not understanding, not sure about what we've been talking about regarding white privilege or uh, whiteness, if, if women were to suddenly propel themselves 100 years into the future and were to use this cultural moment as the barometer for the ways that women are functioning and negotiating in society, you know, if we were just supposed to turn on the TV and see the gratuitous sexuality, the hyper, uh, buffoonery that a lot of women characters are performing um, as though that is the typical female in a in a, in a family or that's a mother figure or this is a sex kitten figure if we actually think that those images are representative of women which we don't then how do you think how how do you how can we base our understanding on race 
based on images that we see in music videos, on TV, uh, in, in commercials and so forth. And I think really a lot of the images that we see and a lot of the people whom we trust are replicating and revivifying these very anxiety inducing characteristics of people that we do not take the time to get to know. So um, I would just suggest that we actively practice, as Melanie said, more eloquently than I, to get to know other people um, beyond those within our immediate neighborhood and in our comfort zone. Thank you, thank you. So we have, I need one minute, uh, Michael. One minute. Less than one minute if possible. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I think the key thing is listening. Um, we need to listen to each other. We need to understand on, uh, where everybody is coming from. We need to go at it with empathy and sympathy and partnership and a, a, a true awakening of knowing that there are people in this country who have not experienced the same positives as other, others. And the idea that those of us who've experienced those positives have the ability to help change. We can't do it, you can't do it alone. Nobody could do this alone. It has to be a societal movement um, overall. And we need to be vocal. We just need to keep fighting. We need to know that if all our communication is in a vacuum, nothing will change. So if somebody black is only talking to black people, that's not gonna work. If white people are only talking to other white people, that's not gonna work. We need to come together, and I just feel like that's where our opportunity is. Thank you, thank you. Last but not least, Brandon, take us home. One minute. So, I'm gonna to try to do this in one minute. Number one thing, where are you gonna be six months from now? This is a moment, but this is not a moment, meaning that you need to be still as activated now as you are, and you are still continuing in this because this is gonna be a fight. This is not gonna be solved overnight. So six months from now, I need people to be still as active. To the white individuals, I need you to have the uncomfortable conversations with your fellow white individuals. I need you to educate yourself. If you are going to enlist black people to be a part of that, you ask us, don't demand us. We are not your textbooks. Okay, mm -hmm. but you ask us to engage in those conversations, but do not demand. Second of all, this can be fixed at an individual level all the way up to a societal level. So are you standing in the gap by changing the work culture to make it better for your fellow black person? Are you challenging the policies that you were seeing that are being uh, hurting us inequitably? Are you doing the thing at the local level and then that'll help to change it at the societal level and get involved. We all have a place and space in this movement. Ask those individuals about how you can help. Don't co-opt, don't co-opt. Thank you, that's the perfect way to end this. And I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, we ended up with 254 people registered for this call. And we have recorded this session live so that uh, you can share this on your Facebook, social media pages, Instagram, uh, Twitter accounts, LinkedIn pages. Uh, we also will have it available on the YouTube. So with that, I am signing off and I wanna thank you all for joining us. And if you can join us for tomorrow, part two of the session with four different groups of individuals. Thank you and have a great day.